Welcome in, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of the On the Pony Express podcast. I'm Billy Embody, and joined today by a special guest, a guy that I'm excited we're on the same team finally, Sooner, Sooner Scoops, Josh McQuistian. Josh, uh, we've seen each other for years at recruiting events especially, but first of all, welcome to On3, and uh, thanks for doing this today. Oh, man, excited to do it, and I feel the same, Billy. There's a lot of guys at On3 that I have either worked with before or wanted to work with, and it's it's worked out pretty nicely for me. Um, well, welcome to On3, and you're here, though, to, to preview – the Oklahoma Sooners, SMU's Week 2 opponent, the Mustangs head up to Norman to face the Sooners 5 p.m. Nice uh, 5 p.m. start instead of what a lot of people I think felt like would have been an 11 a.m. kick most times. Were you surprised that uh, you know that they got the early evening slot? I think covering Oklahoma as long as I have and dealing – with all the the scheduling, which uh, fans love to put on the Big 12 and that sort of thing. But OU just gets a lot of 11 a.m. kickoffs. And I, I know I get it. It's a brand that drags people to their networks early on, and they kind of stick with it. And so, like, you understand the why. But I, I think absolutely this is great news. And at the same time, you're like, well, if you're going to do five, couldn't you just push it to seven? Like, we could just have the night game where maybe it's not 100 degrees at kickoff, you know, where it's just going to be miserable in Oklahoma. Yeah, everybody filing into the stadium around 3, 3.30. It's just going to be just in one. So it's going to be fun. Uh, two of my groomsmen and a couple of my best friends are uh, diehard OU guys. And uh, we, we were just talking about how uh, fun it would have been just to hear a little big new kickoff uh, there one, one final time uh, before the Sooners go to the SEC. Uh, but, you know, we're going to see this 5 o'clock game Last year, Oklahoma, not up to the standard the program usually is, but it was in transition. You know, a lot of things kind of went against the Sooners. A lot of one-possession games went the other way. What was your take on last year's Oklahoma team and, and kind of the work Brent Venables had to do coming in there to really you know, put his own imprint on the program? Well, you know, everybody loves to talk about bounce a ball, you know, just those games. And I thought people kind of ignore when they look at that 2021 team – how many fortunate bounces Oklahoma got that season. I mean, they when they went into Baylor, I believe at 9-0, and they had absolutely no business being 9-0. and like that, that team had scrambled by teams that were far inferior, uh, you know, got out, of, got out alive against Nebraska, Iowa State. I mean, they, they had some very poor performances. And so you just kind of wonder, like, how did this happen? And it felt like Brent Venables had to pay the the law, you know, the football gods had to be, you know, and again, that's not to say that there aren't some things that need to absolutely be fixed from that 2022 team, but they, I, to lose to that West Virginia team in Morgantown, like you almost have to be trying to do it. Like it, it was, it was a bad group, a bad unit and Oklahoma, I mean, the first time in big 12 history lost to West Virginia. So, I mean, it just kind of tells you where, those two programs are and and probably how how much misfortune Oklahoma had there. So I, I my takeaways were that I thought the offense at times showed signs of life. Um, I thought Dylan Gabriel, I, I think he is who he is. I think OU fans are trying to say, oh, there's going to be this big leap. We, we kind of have a book on Dylan Gabriel. I think we kind of know where he is and what he is. But at the same time, they can do more with him offensively this year because now they have Jackson Arnold. They don't have to live in fear of if this guy's out for a series, that series is pretty much a punt. Um, so I think that helps a lot. And then defensively, we'll see. I mean, like I struggle to believe that Brent Venables didn't have almost like we're going to throw the lambs to the slaughter in 2022. And then in 23, we've implemented more of our defense. We're more ready to do what we need to do um, because there, there were, there were no training wheels last year. They didn't simplify things. And I think a lot of those guys head were, was swimming, but you look at the bowl game against Florida state, they had the better of that against Jordan Travis and that offense for a large portion of that game. So I think there are reasons to believe, but I'm like anybody else. They're, they're going to have to show you after six and seven, that's just not acceptable to a place like Oklahoma. Yeah. It, it, SMU is kind of in a similar boat in a sense. SMU fans are waiting for this program to break through and win a conference championship it is something that or even get to the conference championship something that you're going to have to see before you just completely feel good about it luckily for OU fans they've seen a lot of that winning 
over the last uh, you know few decades and, and the course of history, of course. Let's talk about Dylan Gabriel a little bit because SMU's chances riding into this one are going to rely on Preston Stone adjusting quickly after a week one game. He's now the full-time starter. He's got a little bit of experience. Dylan Gabriel has that experience in Jeff Levy's offense now. He's got some skilled position players that are always productive. What's the what's the feeling on what he needs to do to elevate this offense? And, I mean, last year there were just moments where, uh, like you said, it was going to be a punt with the backup in. If he's healthy, this this whole season could go differently. Oh, I don't think there's any question. And I think, again, I think that allows them to be a little more aggressive with him in the run game. They can do stuff that's more designed for him. And it's not that Dylan Gabriel's a special runner or anything like that, but he's obviously capable of picking up yardage when he needs to. Um, and there has there's more willingness to kind of take the shackles off of him and just say, play football the way you want to play football. Don't worry about if this goes badly or something like that. And I think even mentally for a quarterback, that's got to be a freeing kind of thing to just not have that little thing in the back of your mind where if I go down, I'm I'm hurting my team. Um, uh, you almost wonder if also just the presence of Jackson Arnold makes him a better player just because there's somebody staring over his shoulder that, is is frankly just a more talented player. So we'll you know we'll see where that goes. But I, I think when you talk about his growth, and it's something that I thought maybe we'd see this spring. And frankly, I don't think that we did in the spring game. He still missed some throws. There was still some some footwork stuff where you're just kind of like, I that's not where it needs to be. And he was just kind of laid over the middle at times. Now at the same time, Oklahoma's receivers are largely new. He's getting a feel for some of those guys. So there there has to be some understanding there as well. But I, I just think if they're going to go where they want to go, which is obviously back to the Big 12 championship game, and, you know, at Oklahoma, they expect to win that game. That's the way that goes. Um, if they're going to do that, he has got to be a more consistent passer. The, the ability to make some plays with his feet is has to be there. And I, I'm really interested to see – what Jeff Levy will do with him because you look back at that 21 offense at Ole Miss, which obviously we went over at a lot of, a lot of depth. There was a lot more activity to the running backs. There was a lot more quick stuff. And I just, last year it felt like vertical to Marvin Mims, vertical to Marvin Mims. And there just wasn't a lot to stretch the field laterally. And I'm kind of interested to see if that becomes a bigger piece of the puzzle in 23. Uh, Jalil Far Farouk is back. Uh, Drake Stoops. Uh, they did add Andre Anthony. Uh, as well as Brennan Thompson through the transfer portal, two tight ends, Blake Smith, and a familiar face, Austin Stogner, uh, <laughs> coming back, which, again, transfer portal world, that is what it is. Uh, are the weapons good enough for, for that to happen, do you think, right now? To me, that's the biggest question. I love what they have in the running back room, and I, you, know, you, you may want to talk about that here shortly, but I like the running backs quite a bit. At receiver and the skill positions, I think it's a valid question. I, I don't know what they have now we know they've got speed a guy like Andrell Anthony you know for those that don't remember he's the guy that had the massive game against Michigan State his freshman year at Michigan and really did very little outside of that so you don't know what to make of that because in a huge stage he had a massive day well that's worth something but at the same time I from people you talk to around that program drops were a problem you know there was just a again kind of like with Gabriel there was a consistency issue um Jalil Farouk is a guy I've been waiting for for two years to kind of make the breakout. And again, drops at times have been a problem for him. He's kind of one of those guys that'll make the highlight catch and then miss the routine one. And you just kind of, that's, that's a little bit of a struggle at times. Drake Stoops is, is exactly what you'd expect. He's a coach's kid going to make all the, he's going to block. He's going to make all the right plays. He's going to do everything that his physical ability allows him to do. Um, but at the same time, he's, a, he's slightly limited in that way, but, a couple of guys I think to watch out for would be Gavin Freeman, um, a sophomore at Oklahoma City. A uh, lot of comparisons to Wes Welker, frankly, because he's a skill, smaller wide receiver from the exact same high school as Wes Welker Heritage Hall in Oklahoma City. So you get a lot of that. I don't know how fair that is to Gavin, but Gavin's absolutely a quality player. Um, you know, his first touch last year was a 46-yard touchdown. So not, you know, a, a guy that clearly there is some belief that he can be an impact guy. And the other one would be Jaquez Petaway, the uh, you know rival. Uh, excuse me, the top one hundred wide receiver from the uh, Houston area. Yeah, you got some old latency there going on in my uh, my breakdown. But 
a, um, you know, a big time speed guy really can stretch the field. And then you throw in Brendan Thompson. So Jeff Levy wants to attack vertically. That is there in speed. It's just got to be there. There's got to be a connection between these receivers and Dylan Gabriel and at tight end. I don't love what they have. I'll be really honest. I think there's some questions there. I think those guys are best used as blockers on the edge. So long, long, long answer there for you. But I think there is the potential for this to be a solid group, but I don't think it's the groups that you've seen in the past with the CD lambs and the Hollywood Browns and that kind of stuff. Uh, I mean, that's, Hey, that's why we're having you on. I just say <laughs> press go and uh, let you go. Um, mm-hmm. The, the offensive line, I think I was kind of reading up at some lost some depth uh, along the group, but this is a pretty veteran group coming back. Am I wrong on that? Um, or, or, or are they replacing across the board? Uh, no, this is, this is a very veteran group. I mean, okay, McCade Matower, uh, McCade, I think it's Matire. I always say it wrong. Um, oh, he is yeah. entering his second year as a starter for Oklahoma, but he had like 39 career starts at Cal. Um, he's a very, very veteran guy. Uh, Walter Rouse is a four-year starter at Stanford. He's probably going to take over as Oklahoma's left tackle. Uh, he's a guy that didn't get to go through spring. Uh, you know, as a as a transfer guy, he had had a shoulder surgery in the off season and just kind of had to sit out through the spring. But again, with his amount of experience, he's he's like a four, like a three point nine GPA at Stanford guy. I don't think he's going to have a lot of trouble picking things up. He seems like a very very sharp dude. Um, and I think there's belief that there's more in his game that, than that you saw on tape at Stanford. Because, I, you know, speaking to him, he was always open about, you know, I thought I was going to leave and just go to the NFL after my last year at Stanford. I don't think he got the draft grade he was looking for. So there's some a mix of motivation there for him. But just all – everything you're looking for in body type. He's 6'6", barrel-chested. I mean, just a big, impressive-looking guy. Um, the star is Tyler Guyton at right tackle. Tyler Guyton uh, – as unbelievable as it is, Anton Harrison last year was Bill Biedenboe's first ever first-round pick. I mean, that, that's just a hard thing to think about with Orlando Brown and Creed Humphrey and some of the guys he's produced along the offensive line. But Anton was his first, and I think Tyler Guyton has more upside than Anton Harrison. He is a tremendously talented guy, um, incredibly athletic. He's exactly what the NFL is looking for. I mean, six seven, long-armed, moves his feet. I mean, he, he is a special player. Um, and then the other two inside, you've got Andrew Rain, who's going into his third year as a starter, was another big time recruit coming out of high school, has kind of fought injuries, ended last year early with a shoulder problem that he suffered in that West Virginia game I talked about. Um, but I, I, there's every reason to think this could be his best year. I mean, there's a lot of reason, you know, he's, he's get, he's gotten to go through off season. That's why they did the surgery when they did it. So he could still have summer to work out and add some of the muscle and weight he needs to add. Um, and then finally is Savion Bird, uh, you know, a name I'm, I know you're familiar with from Duncanville. At times in that Florida State game, he was a dominant player. And Oklahoma was down to basically like six, seven healthy bodies in the offensive line. They were really yeah. beat up. And he was very flashy at times, but then came back in the spring and was like 20 pounds lighter. And no one could really explain why that had happened or what had happened. So this summer, he needs to put some of that weight back on. Lots of peanut butter and jelly, lots of chocolate milk, you know, all, all the stuff that you and I don't get to eat anymore, Billy. But, um, you know, th- th- that is, that's the kind of thing that he's looking for. And if he can do that, I-, I think there's a chance he's a really special player. It's just he's got to, again, we, there's a word that keeps coming up. It's consistency. He's got to be that guy, snap in and snap out for Oklahoma. And all that leads into the run game. What, what's the run game looking like? I know they, they added a couple of highly touted freshmen. Emeka Megwa is uh, coming in. What does the, the stable look like at Oklahoma? Well, you mentioned the two incoming freshmen, and I think the guy that had a lot of the hype was Dalen Smothers from, South, uh, excuse me, from North Carolina that um, was the big-time recruit, and everybody kind of knew him. And I think Caleb Hicks kind of slid in under the radar from Denton Ryan but they have raved about Caleb Hicks. They are super excited about him. I think they feel his speed is a little – is a bigger component of his game than I think people had given him credit for. I've, he's, I mean, I know you've seen him, Billy, very powerfully built guy, really strong tack, you know, tackle-to-tackle runner. And I think they think there's something there that maybe everybody's not you know, aware of yet. So they're pretty excited about him. But the two that are going to lead the show are Javante Barnes and Gavin Sawchuk, the two returning sophomores. Um, Barnes really had a nice year, super physical, tough runner. Um, 
but is a guy that has a lot of wiggle, some burst to his game. Um, kind of, um, I, I can never think of a good comparison for him, but I mean, he's, he's a guy that behind this offensive line and getting enough carries, he's fully capable of being a thousand yard back. Like he has that kind of ability. Uh, Gavin Sawchuk literally sat out the entire season last year. And you kind of wondered like, is this, is this going to be the guy? Cause he was a top 100 recruit and really made no dent. And then, Eric Gray sat out of the bowl game and Oklahoma put Gavin Sawchuk in there and he just dropped a hundred yards on Florida state. Like it was nothing. Now he had a costly fumble late in the game that really, I, you know, you never want to put it on one guy, but I, that was kind of when the momentum shifted for the Seminoles. Um, but he is very active. I mean, you know, legit 10, 500 meter speed, he can fly. So there, there's a lot there to like, again, the running back room is probably the position on offense that I feel the most confident that Oklahoma knows what they have. They feel good about what they have. And there's a lot of depth to it as well. All right. I'm going to ask a question here and we're going to talk about his teammate uh, later on, but if, if things go South early in the season with Dylan Gabriel, is there any chance we see a local kid play against SMU? I say local, but Denton, Denton Geyer's own Jackson Arnold. Uh, I, it would be hard to do it that early in the season. I think it would be really hard to pull the, pull the trigger. Um, if you told me, OU rolls into Texas and they're, you know, little over 500 and it's just not gone the way anybody hoped it would be. If Jackson Arnold started in the cotton bowl, I would not be shocked. I mean, that, that to give you some answer of, I know we're talking about the SMU game, but just, I do think it's closer than people think it is between a guy that's had as much experience and frankly success as Dylan Gabriel has. But De Jackson Arnold has more than lived up to what everybody wanted for, you know, I'm sure SMU fans largely didn't watch the OU spring game, but the spring game had a ridiculous scoring system. It was like 78 to 84 Jackson Arnold. They, I mean, it was so clearly, clearly orchestrated that they had set up Jackson Arnold to have the final drive of the game. And it was one of the few times he got to run out with the first team offense, took him down the field, ties the game. And he has got a two point conversion to win. And the ball's dropped in the back of the end zone. Like it, it should have been like his moment. And it just, it came up a little short for no fault of his own. But yeah, um, I, I have told, you know, obviously doing some other things like this, talking to other reporters. I, if I'm a defensive line coach for an opposing team, I'm like, I'm not sure I want to knock Dylan Gabriel out of this game. I'm not sure that's going to go the way I think it will. Yeah, it's very different than uh, last year against TCU, mm -hmm. for example. Um, I, I feel like with the, this matchup between OU and SMU, I, I, I know a little bit about the Sooners because of how much I watch them with my friends. Um, defensively, this is where this team, I feel like, maybe surprised a little bit in the sense that you brought in a defensive coordinator like Brent Venables and you had some pieces, but it didn't just – it didn't come together like people maybe thought it was going to. What is kind of the mindset of this year's defense uh, now that they've had a chance to add – you know, some guys on that side of the ball. I mean, I look at PJ coming in, the five-star. I know he's got to put on some weight, but they've added some nice pieces along with Peyton Bowen in the secondary. Oh, absolutely. I, you know, that – and I think Peyton Bowen is a good embodiment of, of what that defense has done because that safety room has gone from a lot of question marks to maybe the strength of the defense in the matter of like a year. Uh, Peyton Bowen – uh, Reggie Pearson transferring in from Texas Tech. Uh, Billy Bowman is a guy that I don't think nationally people understand how good Billy Bowman can be if he can, again, had some injury problems, got uh, people, you know, the Dylan Gabriel injury against TCU kind of overshadowed everything else that happened in that game. Billy Bowman on a kick return early in that game gets knocked out of the game, really was never right again at any point that season. But I thought at the time he got injured, he was playing as well as any safety in the Big 12. Like he, he, They really think he can be a big-time guy and kind of be a leader for that defense. Um, the back seven is as good a group as I've seen at Oklahoma in you know, several years. And I, I know that's not saying a lot as bad as Oklahoma has been defensively for the last decade. Let's, let's just be real about it. Uh, that's but been there a, is a bugaboo for, for my oh, friends on that one. Yeah, I, and I get it. I mean, like dealing with people on the Crimson Corner on our site, like th th there is, there's not a lot you can say defensive. Like, you know, I, I can't take defense because it's awful by any metric you want to look at. It's bad. Um, but, you know, you return uh, a, a four year starter in Woody Washington at one corner. Gentry Williams, I think, is going to take the other corner spot. Big time recruit a couple of years ago out of the Tulsa area that 
you just see him walking around. OU hasn't had many corners that look like that. I mean, yeah, and this is a guy six foot, you know, 185 pounds and genuinely could be an Olympian type 400 meter runner. Like he is, he is especially gifted and had a kind of a scare uh, early in the summer workout, uh, excuse me, early in uh, winter workouts. And it seems like everything's back to normal. He, he's doing everything he needed to do. So that's, that's the concern is kind of passed over that. And then at linebacker, you look at Danny Stutzman, you look at um, uh, kind of the Connor uh, Neal kid that they have brought in uh, from Ferris State of all places. They, they think he's got a chance to start. So that's going to be interesting. The defensive line is the question. I mean, that, that, that's where they have got to get better. And I think they have. And I, you know, I know you'll want to go a little bit blow by blow about this, but I, I think there is room to think that group is better. Now, let's go into the defensive line. What, what, where do you think the strengths are? Where, where, where are they missing some some pieces? Just at least going into the season, and yeah, that's the that's the group out of you know the three levels was the one I had the least mm -hmm. you know info about and, and the most questions, I guess. Yeah, you know, you mentioned PJ Adabare, uh, guy that you know showed up to campus about six four and a half, former five star, one of the really elite pass rushers, and frankly, I, I've covered OU recruiting for almost twenty five years. I I've never seen OU have a guy like this. I mean, he is just freakishly, freakishly gifted. Um, I think you're looking. You know, he's probably going to hit the season at two hundred and fifty pounds. I mean, they they are just throwing weight on him as quickly as they can. Wow. And it, it, he's another guy, kind of like what I was talking about with Jackson Arnold. If you told me he starts the Texas game, you know, they give him a few weeks to find his feet, like it won't shock me. But I can almost guarantee SMU will see plenty of him. Like they, they are going to put him on the field as much as they can. It kind of a, you know, sink or swim. You know, they're going to get him out there and see what happens. Um, Rondell Bothroyd, the transfer from Wake Forest, has been that they are very pleased with where he has come. Uh, you know, Oklahoma returns most of their starting defensive line, but I think you're going to see some turnover here. I think Rondell Bothroyd is going to take somebody's job. I think it'll probably be Reggie Grimes that ends up kind of behind him, uh, opposite of Ethan Downs. Uh, the, you know, Ethan's made some early uh, All-Big 12 lists and things like that, but I've always been one, and I, you hear some talk this summer that he may, maybe in passing situations, you might see him slide inside a little bit and do some different things with him where I think he, frankly, fits better. Um, but to me, I think the defensive end group is approaching solid, I guess would be the best way I could say that. Now, if, if Adebare can be the guy that his, you know, if, if he can really jump from an early point, then maybe that becomes more than that with he and Bothroyd being uh, a couple of very, you know, very solid pass rushers in 2023. It's a defensive tackle where you have questions. You just, there's no... There's no clear difference maker. They've got some solid bodies. Uh, bringing in Dazon Terry from uh, Tennessee, the uh, portal transfer here late, late in the game, um, I think was a big win for them. Had some good production at Tennessee. Not a world beater, but I think what they're hoping is they can just keep throwing body after body after body. And I think they've got now five, six defensive tackles that are, are at least in their fourth year of college. I mean, these are old men that are just kind of those grizzled old veterans that may not be superstars, but again, they can just keep those guys fresh and keep them moving. Yeah. It, it, looking at Oklahoma from my perspective, it, it's kind of interesting. It, and this is just a note on the recruiting class. They brought in the two best high school football players I saw last season were Jackson Arnold, Peyton Bowen. And the best athlete I saw was PJ Adebore. <laughs> to hear that he is up to 250 pounds is pretty scary um, SMU has two veteran tackles, guys who've played a lot of college football, but uh, they will have their hands full with him, uh, no doubt about it. Uh, is Peyton Bowen going to start right away? Is that do you think that happens? I, I, I know he's he's just so good. I I think it's a situation where I don't know if he'll be ready to start, but I don't know how long you can keep him off the field because he is he's you know he had a huge interception in the spring game that everybody kind of raved about. I think made some, you know, it, it went a little bit viral there for a little while. And that's the kind of guy that OU hasn't had. Are these kind of guys that can make those game changing plays? And I think, Oklahoma, you know, it's Oklahoma. I, I think this idea that Oklahoma hasn't had any talent on defense, that's, that's just not realistic. Oklahoma had schools, you know, I, I've tried to tell OU fans for 10 years, 
there's all but about 10 schools in the country would change, would trade defensive rosters with Oklahoma in a heartbeat. Like it, it's not just lack of talent. There's been other mitigating circumstances, but they haven't had those premier frontline guys where Peyton Bowen and PJ Adabari could have signed about anywhere they wanted to in the country. Oklahoma hasn't had many guys like that in a while. So I think that is what they're hoping for. And again, Peyton Bowen, Oklahoma is going to run plenty of three safety stuff. Um, they are in position, like I said, where they can mix up personnel groupings. They can do some different stuff. And we all know Brent Venables, that's what he wants to do. And, you know, we, we can talk about Ted Roof being the defensive coordinator. Brent Venables is running that defense. Make, make no mistake about it. And he's going to do – he's going to try everything he can to confuse you in the back because he knows his front isn't good enough to just beat you man for man. So he's going to try to throw things at you, confuse your quarterback, and – He's got a pretty good track record of that. We'll have to see if he can if he can make all that work. I mean, it's it's definitely a you know it's up in the air how that goes. But I think there is reason to believe Peyton Bowen is going to find plenty of playing time this year. Uh, you mentioned some different things that have happened around OU's roster. I was actually there for, and I'm sorry to bring this up, but the the I think it was the Bryce Petty game when uh, he was just throwing mm-hmm. hitches, hitches, hitches. <laughs> I've never been to a game where fans openly booed from the start when the offense and defense break the huddle, or there was no huddle then, but whatever, and they were lined up about 12 yards off. And just fans were just booing. And that play hadn't even happened. And they were just booing defensive formations. I think that was one of uh, the last – I think that was the last or second to last game that Stoops was D.C. Uh, uh, scarily enough, he continued on for four or five years past that point. Like, that that's how thats how toxic that relationship uh, became between Mike Stoops and OU fans. But, yeah, and you – the. I, every time I think back to that game, I think of poor Julian Wilson, who was one of the corners that was playing off that whole day. And you know he had to feel like, I, I'm not in control of this. They're telling me to play with this cushion. Yeah, like I can't do anything about this. But I think it was Mike just trying to say, we can't cover these guys outside vertically. We're going to try to keep everything in front of us and hope Bryce Petty screws up. And that did not go that way that day. It's a quiet car ride back from Norman that day. But Absolutely. Um, uh, let, let's end on this. And I don't think many people will pick SMU outright on this one. They've brought in a ton of new faces. They do have a new starter at quarterback. They have some power five transfers that are highly touted and, and talented. But OU does have a roster that has been recruited at a high level for a long time. Uh, they are coming off a tough season. But I, I, I think this one, if SMU gets the quarterback play that they think they are, and if OU maybe doesn't get the quarterback play they think they are, this one could be close. What's your take on the game? Yeah, and, and I should start off with, I was a huge Gavin Stone fan. Like, I I, I think he's going to do, excuse me, Preston Stone. I, oh, I say what a big fan I am and then mess his name up. I apologize. Yeah, but that, that's his older brother. So, you you know, yeah. that just shows <laughs> how, how long you've been in the camp. Uh, but no, that is, um, he's a guy that, <clears throat> excuse me, I really thought was was going to be a big time player. I Frankly, knowing Tanner Mordecai, and you know, I again, no offense to Tanner, I was impressed Tanner held him off as long as he did. Um, but I, I think that is um, a guy with just so much potential. But for Oklahoma, I mean, I think this is one of those games where you would hope that after last year, focus isn't a problem for Oklahoma. You, you would hope, okay, they come in locked in. Like you said, it's going to be a night crowd. We know they're going to be a little lubed up. Like it's it's going to be, you know, there there should be some energy in the building. Um, so uh, you would think Oklahoma comes out and and if they're going to do what they should do in this game, comes out and gets on them early, makes a few stops, kind of like I said earlier, does a few things to confuse a young quarterback, throws some looks at him maybe he hasn't seen. But if if they come out flat, there's no question that that SMU there's enough talent on that team to cause some problems and make this interesting. And frankly, we've seen OU do this for years where they just against a team that, uh, you know, again, I don't mean this to upset any SMU fans that Oklahoma is clearly more talented than and just not handle business and let it, let them hang around to the third quarter, fourth quarter. I mean, you know, we watched that dumpster fire Nebraska team almost come in and beat Oklahoma in Norman. And that was a, 
an Oklahoma team that people thought was going to compete for a national title had a Heisman Trophy returning candidate and Spencer Rattler. And now we all know better now, yeah. but you know, and I guess I should say for anybody listening, I was one of the few detractors on uh, Spencer Rattler, but that's a, that's another story for another day. Um, but yeah, th- there is. I think what Oklahoma will want to do is set up the run, try to really be physical, try to bully SMU early on with that size up front, because it, it is, it's a massive offensive line. It's a really big group. Uh, again, assuming Savion Bird is eating his peanut butter and jellies this, uh, this off season. But uh, there's a lot to lie, you know, a lot to think that Oklahoma can win this game. But I think if you're looking for things, Dylan Gabriel had some problems with turnovers last year. You look at that Baylor game where Oklahoma had four turnovers. And I think three of them were Dylan Gabriel interceptions. Like the, the, there were, there were problems at times managing the football. I mentioned Gavin Sawchuck, Sawchuck's key fumble against Florida state. They had some trouble with ball control last year. So I wonder, it's a little bit of, I think they can do these things, but we'll have to see. I mean, there's a valid question to it. And if SMU can just hang around till halftime, that lubed up crowd starts to go from very excited to very anxious and that I mean, we've all been in those stadiums when it goes like that, that bleeds into the roster. I mean, those, those guys can feel the tension and okay, we can't lose this game. This, this is unacceptable. And we've seen, oh, you do this too many times for me to say, oh, there's, there's no chance here. This, there's every reason. And again, if Preston Stone can come out cooking, I, you can put some heat on this team in, in some interesting ways. Yeah, it's going to be fun. I'll be up there. I know a lot of SMU fans are rolling up there. So uh, looking forward to that one, an early season. Uh, it, it's a crazy thought because every time you look at SMU OU, you would think, oh, they, you know, they play each other a bunch. But I, I, don't, I think this is the 11th meeting or maybe even the 9th or something like that. It's a very minimal amount of time. So um, with them being so close, it'll be fun to get together. And then uh, we'll host you all uh, down in Dallas in 2027, I think. So it'll be a good time. When, uh, when Oklahoma's coming in as an SEC team, which maybe by 2027 will sound normal, but it sure doesn't right now. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, my buddies are uh, still adjusting to uh, the phrase, <laughs> it just means more. So. <laughs> oh, oh no. Just, just tell them they can't chant SEC. That, that's, that's not acceptable for an Alabama win anyway. Oh, man. Well, Josh, I appreciate your time. Took up way too much of it, but uh, we, we really appreciate your insight and everything. I mean, there's – Nobody better to really have on to talk OU football than, than yourself. So we appreciate all the time you've given to the pod. And uh, we'll have you on uh, during the, the season when it gets to game week. Sounds great, Billy. And enjoyed it. I apologize for of the 30 or so minutes we've done. I think I've talked for 28 of them. So I, I apologize. Everybody had to listen. That, that's uh, hey, it makes my job easy. And it gives <laughs> uh, the listeners a break from my voice, which uh, they get tired of, I'm sure. All right. Well, have a great fourth, Josh. And, and thanks so much for joining the pod. Absolutely. Enjoyed it, Billy. That was Josh McQuistian from Sooner Scoop, part of the On3 network uh, now. So we're excited uh, to have them. We'll have more uh, from Josh as the season gets going, uh, you know, and SMU heads to Oklahoma. Hope you guys enjoyed that interview. I do want to close with a few thoughts on the game as well. Um, I look at this matchup and, and honestly getting to have Josh on probably reinforced my thought that SMU is a chance here. There's a lot of questions around Oklahoma uh, heading into this one uh, or or heading into this season, I should say, because of the season they just had. Now, this is an Oklahoma team that had a lot of one possession losses last year. I believe four of them. uh, And, and, and it might've even been three or three points or less or, or something like that, but they missed out on having a, you know, 10 win season by not having some bounces go their way. Um, having Dylan Gabriel knocked out against TCU. But this is a roster that has a lot of talent. Brent Venables recruited very well uh, to kick off his tenure, especially this 2023 class. I'm really, really high on what Oklahoma brought in, especially at the top end of the class. There's a lot of guys that SMU fans are going to see play a lot in that week two game uh, up in Norman. And I think between Dylan Gabriel and how well he can move the offense and and put together drives and make big plays and do those things. And maybe some of those freshmen and maybe some of the transfers that they're expecting to contribute right away, maybe that's how Oklahoma cements itself back at the top of the Big 12. And, and this is a tough, tough, tough game for SMU anyway. You slice it, but 
really can pull away and, and make this one, you know, non-competitive in a sense. Um, but on the flip side of that, you know, like Josh said, you know, Dylan Gabriel is who they think he is, you know, for the most part. Uh, people expecting it to be this dramatic step forward for him, uh, I think are probably going to be, you know, mistaken. Um, so I, I think you look at this matchup for SMU and it's all going to be about how this team comes out. Look back at last year, SMU TCU, everyone is juiced up, ready to go. Sonny Dykes returns to the hilltop. This isn't the same because you're not facing Sonny Dykes in, in that charged environment and that week. You're facing Oklahoma, a big program among the nation's top blue blood football programs. And you have a chance to go into Norman and break hearts. And and you're playing the underdog role. But you can't come out like SMU came out against TCU. And it's going to be hot still at 5 o'clock um, on September in that uh, second week of September. But you can't come out and spot them, you know, three touchdowns and try to battle back the whole time. And we saw SMU make that TCU game competitive. It was one of their most competitive games all season. And SMU has to be ready from that focus standpoint. And when you look at some of the big games last year for SMU, that is where there were moments throughout the season. We saw them come out and I think they came out well against UCF. I think they came out well against Maryland. There were some moments where they didn't capitalize on their opportunities. That was the biggest difference for SMU in some of those losses was not capitalizing on opportunities given to win the game. You know, Tanner Mordecai's fumble against uh, Maryland. You know, just coming out flat in general against TCU. Obviously, UCF made adjustments in the second half and pulled away, and SMU also missed out on some opportunities there. This team can't go up to Norman and miss out on opportunities if OU gives them those opportunities. I think this one is going to be very interesting because I think – for me, you can look at the quarterbacks as the keys, but I do think the offensive lines especially are going to be very key factors. You talk, you heard Josh talking about how the Oklahoma offensive line is a veteran group. You know, they don't have much depth behind them. There's still a question mark here or there. You know, Savion Bird is expected to play a lot. Seems like there's questions with him. If SMU can get any sort of push or dial up any sort of pressure on Dylan Gabriel, that's going to be critical. Just having watched a few OU games last year when he was at quarterback, that was when things went really wrong uh, for that offense. When things are comfortable and he's got time, things are clicking. And they're one of the better offenses, I, I think, just most potent in the country. Um, and, and I'm very high on Jeff Levy as, a, as an offensive coordinator. And on SMU side of things, this veteran group on the offensive line, Marcus Bryant, Hyron White, Whoever ends up along the interior, there's going to be a lot of starts between them. Branson Hickman, Ja'Kai Clark, Justin Osborne, maybe Thalen Robinson. Uh, ben Sparks would be the only kind of new face in there. Um, Caleb Johnson and Logan Parr are now on campus. Those are two guys that add some size. Uh, P.J. Williams. SMU has some depth at, on the offensive line. Can they hold off this OU front? That is the biggest question on their defense. If they can, and they can give Preston Stone time, if they can give Jalen Knight in a little bit of space, that might change things as well for SMU. SMU's defense is completely revamped. They've got a lot of veterans on that defense, though, now at every level. They might not have played together, but Charles Woods, Chris Meganson, Jonathan McGill, uh, Brandon Crosley, Ahmad Moses played a good bit last year, but Brian Massey's back with him. Ahmad Walker, Kobe Wilson. Jordan Miller, Devere Levelson, Elijah Chapman, Elijah, Ch uh, Elijah Roberts. There are a lot of guys on SMU's defense that have played a lot of football, and some of them that have played in some really big environments. So this is a team that shouldn't necessarily be in shock and awe when they go up to Norman. It is a different environment from what SMU has gone into pretty much, uh, I, I would say, since – going to Baylor and going to AM last in the last decade. That's probably the closest thing. TCU, it just seems like, yes, they have a great, you know, stadium and for SMU, like it, it turns out, but the charged atmospheres 
doesn't it, it just I don't think it gets to you know Oklahoma level. So SMU will have to control their emotions. They come in as the underdog. No one expects them to win. I look for uh, a line. There's not one out yet. But they got to be able to to play within themselves and not try to do too much. That's why SMU needs to keep to the basics. Um, and if they do that, they're going to have a shot. They try to do too much. If they um, are are careless with the football, uh, if they you know try to make a big play on defense and take a bad angle or jump a route or whatever, you know Oklahoma has the talent to obviously take advantage of that. So it's going to be a very interesting matchup. I, I don't have a score prediction. I'm still not ready to necessarily predict SMU uh, going up there and beating them, but I, I do think it's got a chance, like Josh said, Josh said, to be a good football game um, and and competitive. So. Appreciate Josh for jumping on board. Hope you guys uh, enjoyed this edition of the podcast. Uh, be sure uh, to enjoy your 4th of July. Dropping this for you guys on uh, Monday the 3rd. Uh, so hope you guys have a great, safe 4th of July. Uh, I know I'm enjoying the beach. Uh, at, we didn't record this on Monday. This is uh, pre-recorded. But um, also a quick reminder, uh, on the Pony Express, July 24th, Katie Trail Ice House Outpost. We're going to have our subscriber meetup. So come uh, meet us up there. We'll talk some recruiting, talk some fall camp, preview that, um, and much more. So uh, we'll all get together. We try to do that a few times a year. Uh, so whether you subscribe to YouTube, whether you subscribe to the site, come join us. If you don't subscribe to the site and you come join us at uh, Katie Trail Ice House Outpost in Plano, uh, I will comp you a month if you subscribe to OnThePonyExpress.com. So let me know. Um, always available via DM email uh, in the comments section. Appreciate you guys subscribing to our YouTube channel and uh, hope everybody has a great 4th of July. We'll be back later in the week uh, with another edition of the On the Pony Express podcast. Thanks for listening. We'll catch you next time.